This is an instrument built by John Monleon. The dust is not John's, but the instrument is certainly reflective of the extraordinary quality of the work he does. Uh, this is one of his grand artist mandolins. John started, like so many, faithfully reproducing the lore instruments specifically, and arrived at the conclusion, after having built quite a few of them, that there were uh, other possibilities for superb voices and uh, for design aesthetic that uh, needed to be explored. And uh, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but uh, it certainly seems to me that the direction that John has headed in with his, de his mandolin design is truly exceptional. Visually, uh, in terms of the voice of the instrument, the playability, these, as so many of these others are, all of them, they're works of art. Uh, and, and with a voice all its own, especially when it's played in tune, I find. John has departed from traditional F5 construction in a variety of ways. Uh, his scroll is quite different, elongated and pointed rather than tighter and more closely curled. Um, Almost like a breaking wave. Mm -hmm. so, um, and the tail pieces? The tail piece is cast bronze. Uh, he's adopted a dropped shoulder on the treble side point for, uh, I think, both aesthetic reasons and for increased access to the upper reaches of the fingerboard. John, as far as I know, was, was uh, one of the first modern builders, and this is not a new idea, but this is an interpretation of the mounting of a pickguard to the side of the fingerboard without requiring the hardware to anchor it to the side of the instrument. And the abbreviated size, as well as that particular anchoring feature, are, are two notable changes that, um, though they had been done in earlier years, um, John's reinterpretation, I think, has become something of a standard today. There was much discussion on the commando list last week about the pickguard. I think it was in regard to Chris Thiele's mandolin, but, um, which Lynn, I think, did a similar type of thing with the pickguard as well. That's right. Because people were asking how it was attached. And I believe he took it right off, but uh, he, he did. It started out along with the scroll. scroll. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. The Sansa scroll, I think, <laughs> is how they. Yes. Now we're um, speaking of fingerboards. Were fingerboards? At what point did luthiers start radiusing fingerboards? And what's the purpose of that? Some people like them. Some people hate them. I happen to like them. It gives me. I find it must be a function of the shape of your hands or your fingers or whatever. But I find that it gives me a, a lot greater access with the radius fingerboard to the upper registers of the fingerboard. And I do believe it's easier on the hand as well. Well, honestly, I don't know among mandolin builders who was the first to introduce a radius fingerboard. Uh, Lyon and Healy uh, regularly produce compound radius fingerboards for their instruments in the teens and twenties, though not universally across the line with their instruments. Some you will find with flat fingerboards, but they are the first that I'm aware of, though probably not the first to do it, but again, very much uh, inspired by violin standards, if you will. Their instruments, I think, more than, than most reflected that violin sensibility with the carved scroll headstock and so forth. But the fingerboard was um, very definitely radius in most of their instruments, and a compound radius as, radius as opposed to uh, straight radius, so that at the Nut, for instance, it may have a radius of somewhere in the range of 7 to 8 inches, and perhaps at the fingerboard extension, 12 to 14 inches, so that the radius increases as you go. Um, what the physics or the, the rationale behind it would be for the violin, I'm not conversant specifically with that, but know that there, it, it, it is designed to be comfortable, to be um, truly accessible to the hand, and I think the same thinking was applied, that uh, it's frankly easier to play. Mm -hmm. And you'll probably find any number of people who would disagree with that statement and maintain that a flat fingerboard is just as comfortable and offers you all of what a radius board does. I would disagree. I think that there is, uh, there's greater comfort for the left hand. That's important. Um, I think that overall you can do things with a radius fingerboard with less effort right. than with a flat fingerboard. And granted, the exceptions out there can play circles around me. But um, Simon Mayer. Yeah. Um, I was asking Simon last summer about radius fingerboards, and he said, I hate them. And he's obviously one of the greatest players going. Mm -hmm. um, and that's hard to argue with. Yeah. Uh, just as to watch uh, uh, the players who have such virtuosic ability and don't need a fingerboard, uh, excuse me, 
Uh, they need their fingerboards, actually. Pick cards. Um, I'm a great believer in pick cards for a variety of reasons, as you are, and uh, I think that, that the players who don't... This is a broad statement, but I'll make it anyway. I think the players who don't need... whose technique is such that they don't need a pick guard, uh, whose technique is such that a uh, radius fingerboard is sort of a matter of indifference for them, they're exceptions. And I think that for most of us, this is enough work to play one of these wonderful things, that all of the, the elements that might conspire to help us play better those are good, good things. Right. So I do, do believe pick cards, radius fingerboards, the things that make the player's job a little easier, um, the ultimate goal being expression, if you can more readily express yourself because the instrument really makes it easy to do that. Right. Those are things I want. I never had a uh, pick guard. I had a, an F5 copy before I bought my Rides and my that I have. And uh, so that was the first time I ever had a pick guard. And I noticed that. Um, in my playing, I don't post on the pick guard at all, but I just have the faintest brush of it with my hand, and it just gives me a reference point, I think, of, of where to keep my hand. I don't apply any pressure, but I can feel it there. It's and the it elevation. It, yeah, it yeah, makes a difference. Well, let's hear the Monteleone just in a brief little classical setting. One of uh, 12 Gallant Duets by Philippe de Chenville, uh, loosely interpreted by moi. Wonderful tone. I thought it was uh, very warm sounding, woody, uh, very well balanced from bottom to top. Beautiful. Um, I noticed but when you were sitting down that looking at the back of the hardware, I thought you could show the camera that that's quite impressive actually. And the parents, I think that. I suppose it's worth talking about some of these these various features because one of the the things that I think has impelled this this project is that uh, there are so many players and so many builders that um, in many cases these things are known by reputation at best. It's hard to get your hands on a Monteleone. It's very hard to get your hands on a Dudenbostel. Um or a Duff. They these builders are are of magnificent ability and yet. They are individuals, and, and the output is such that, frankly, they're hard to get your hands on. It's hard to know what, what uh, qualities we're talking about when you play a model young grand artist. Well, unless when you're, you're Chris Teele, and then... Right. Would that we were. And people shower you with instruments. That would be great. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about hardware for a second. This instrument, this is the oldest of the bunch. And um, this was built at a time, this is about 1983, and so it, it really uh, it, it qualifies as a 21st century mandolin in the sense that John is building today and building more and more magnificent instruments. This one is, is of the last century, but, but I think qualifies as, as an example nonetheless. Tuners that were available then were um, not particularly wonderful. They were okay, but there weren't the choices we have today. And so, um, as happens with so many tuners over the years, they can become problematic. These were swapped for brand new Grovers. And uh, they're very nice tuners. They're very handsome. Uh, post spacing can be an issue, and so mm -hmm. when you have to change tuners, it can be a problem if the holes don't match up with the tuners that are on the market nowadays. So vintage owners are uh, frequently faced with a challenge. Um, fortunately, we have some choices today that we didn't have before, and that's terrific. So 
the tuners that had been there are now replaced with these wonderful Grovers that both look great and work extremely well. Now I noticed that the uh, there's a strip of finish that's either worn or, or intentionally taken off here, much as um, Jimmy Gaudreau likes a, a back of his neck unfinished as well. So is this just wear or was that intentional? I'm going to guess that's where. I don't honestly know in this case. This is a well-traveled instrument. It was uh, uh, used by a working pro for many years, and um, I'm going to guess that that's where. Uh, as, as you'll see in, in, in abundance on some of these instruments, they're, they're dearly loved, well cared for, but they um, frequently will show the signs of the wonderful use they've had, and I think that's just part of it. I like that sort of thing.